Today, though, we're going to talk about thankful no matter what. Thankful no matter what. I'm going to use two stories to try to get that through. Okay, two stories. One of them is uh, uh, we're going to be dealing with, from the Bible, the, the book of Job. We're looking at Job and how Job was thankful through whatever he experienced. And then we'll also be looking at, since we're celebrating Thanksgiving on Thursday, we're going to look at the story of the pilgrims a little bit. Uh, as we do that too. So if you get your Bibles though, I know the pilgrims are not in the Bible. The King James Version was written after the pilgrims, I think, somewhere in that time frame, but they're not included in there, okay? <laughs> uh, get your job books. Job chapter 42. We're going to read a few passages here to get us started and then we'll, we'll go the rest of the way. Job chapter 42, beginning of verse 1. And it says, Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything, and that no thought can be withholden from thee. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered that I understood not, things too wonderful for me, which I knew not. Here I beseech thee, and I will speak. I will demand of thee and declare thou unto me. I have heard of thee from the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. Wherefore I abhorred myself and repent in dust and ashes. Verse 10. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then came there unto him all his brethren and all his sisters and all that that had been of his acquaintance before and did eat bread with him in his house and they bemoaned him and comforted him over all the evil the Lord had brought upon him. Every man also gave him a piece of money and everyone an earring of gold. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for this opportunity we have that we can come, we can worship you through studying your word. I pray right now you help me to be able to communicate to these people the words you have for me to give to them today. Help us, Lord, to look at this thing of thanksgiving and how, Lord, we can be thankful no matter what. Of course, in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You know, it's easy during Thanksgiving time to enjoy the feast. And notice, it's not those times it's not just eating a dinner. It's a feast, right? There's more than you can eat. That makes a feast, doesn't it? Now, most time I sit down at the supper table... We have enough to eat, but we don't try to fix a lot of extra because I don't like leftovers. But when you eat a feast, there's going to be leftovers, right? <laughs> but we also spend time Thanksgiving, we eat a feast. Some of us watch football on TV. It's one of the only times I actually watch the football games. Uh, the rest of the time, I get I just too many things in my mind, so I watch them once in a while. But I do watch a few on football games on TV until they get blown away, and then like if you watch Detroit, they always get blown away, so you only watch that about first quarter and you're done with that game, right? Uh, <laughs> but anyway, and then of course Dallas, I think, usually comes on, so you, you know, you're either root for them or against them, everybody's for or against them. But, um, but as we, uh, 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 the, the, we are comfortable, we sit on our comfortable couches, and we take our lives for granted. We forget what Thanksgiving's all about. We're enjoying ourselves in the season but we forget what the purpose of the Thanksgiving is all about. So we're going to review today the story of Job. Job was a righteous man. He was truly a righteous man. He feared God and he hated evil. He was, by the way, the richest man in all of the land of us. Job chapter 1 Verses one, verse, Job chapter 1, verse 2 and 3 says, And there was born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camel, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 she-asses, and a great, a great household. So that this man was the greatest of all the men of the east. He wasn't just the richest man in town. He was the richest man in his entire part of the world. Job. We know he was a loving father because he prayed for his children in case they were sinners. How many of us as parents pray for our children and hope that they don't sin? 
Lord, I pray you take care of them, right? I pray they're not among me now, so I pray for them. Once they get out of your control, you know, Lord, are they doing what they're supposed to be doing? You raise them up the best you can, but in the end, they have to. The Bible tells us when, they're, when you raise up a child in the way to go and old and not depart from it, that does not mean they will do what you want them to do. That's not what that passage means. When it says when you raise up a child in the way he will go, that means you raise them up knowing the truth of God's word, and when they're old, it stays with them. Whether they accept it or they reject it, they can't leave it behind because it is with them forever. They can choose to reject and die and go to hell, you understand. I always people say that mothers praying for their children to get their children saved, and that's how the children got saved. Well, praying is important that God sends things in their lives, but in the end, there's not enough prayer you can pray to get somebody saved. Do you hear me? You can't pray somebody in, they've got to accept on their own. You certainly should be praying for your children, should be praying for your neighbors, pray for the lost, absolutely, that God sends something in their lives, someone in their lives, so that they have the opportunities to recognize their sin and get saved. There's nothing wrong with that, and we should be doing that every day. Hopefully you're praying for lost people today because God answers our prayers. He will give you, He will put something in their path. But in the end, they have to choose. Noah, I mean Noah, well, he's one of the great guys, but they weren't the right one. He was a rich man too, but anyway. <laughs> Job prayed for his children. He sacrificed for his children. He made burnt offerings for them in case they were sinning. <laughs> um, Satan took notice of this man of God and wanted to test him in his faith. Satan take notice of us too. When you're trying to do the right thing and you're working God, you're working things, you're doing things for God, does trouble come your way? Does it? Matter of fact, the more you're trying to do for God, it seems like the more trouble comes your way. Is that an accident? Not an accident at all. It's a plan. Well, it's an interesting, we get to open up here in this story. In this story here, we're able to look behind the curtain and see what happens in heaven. At the throne of God, we can see what's happening here. Now, I'm not going to go through all those details. God, I'm going to cover what I need to cover of this. But it's a fascinating book. Read it, and you'll see things in there that God reveals to us in His Word about the interactions of Satan and his cronies and God. But Satan took notice, and uh, he wanted to do something. But to do something to God's people, I told you, I was, I was, watch, I was walking, um, I was telling this morning on my, on my I have a ministry, you know, besides this one, called The Battles Within, on every Sunday morning at 8.30, then I have a, it's doing Who is Jesus series. Well, I was telling this morning on there that I was, one of the, Friday night, we had a little social at a place they were going to, as uh, they had, Meatballs and stuff like that, you know, stuff, food for us to eat. And uh, uh, so we walk in over there, and one of the part of the building that we were at, uh, they were redoing it so it was dark, you know, and kind of eerie. And we're walking down beside it, and, and uh, we're walking to a group of people, and one lady said, the time she said, she said, that looks like, it, that's like a kind of a haunted house, don't it? It's kind of scary. <laughs> I said, mm, okay. She said, well, but I don't believe in ghosts. Do you? I said, sure, I believe in ghosts. What? I said, yeah, I believe in ghosts. The Holy Ghost. Don't you? I got to believe in ghosts. I believe in the Holy Ghost. She said, oh, no, I was talking about dead people's spirits. I said, no, no, that's not true. Dead people are dead. You're either in heaven or hell. They don't walk in the room. They're not roaming the world <laughs> looking for a place to go. They open their eyes in hell or they open their eyes in the arms of Jesus. One of the two, right? Now, can demons, can demons act upon you like a ghost of a dead person? Of course they can. But I'll tell you, if you see a ghost, it ain't a ghost. It's a demon messing with you. But you know what? They can't mess with us. I said, I ain't worried about it. They can't do nothing to me because I'm a child of God. 
I have protection of the Holy Spirit. They can't mess with me. A demon cannot possess a, 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 a Christian. They can't. They can't dwell within you. You understand? We're protected. So here, not here I'm going to say no over and over again. If I say no, you know I'm talking about Job. Job said, Job, uh, Job, uh, God said that uh, Satan said, hey, uh, a God pointed Satan to Job and said, hey, because Satan already knew it. Satan had on his mind that he was going to talk about Job. But see, God already knows what Satan was going to do, for Satan does it, don't he? So we know that he was going to take notice of him. But uh, before he could do anything, he had to have permission. See, before God can let, before Satan can do anything to you, any type of testing and trials for you, God has to give him permission. Isn't that great? He's got to give him permission. So Satan, so we know that is true, by the way. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 says, There have no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but with but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. God will not let him do something to you that you cannot endure. Now, do we fail? Yes, we do. Sometimes that temptation, we can endure it, but we don't. You understand? Isn't that bad? It's true, though. But here he was. God pointed out Job to Satan as a man whom he could test because he was sure that Job wasn't going to fail. I know Job. Job ain't going to fail. Have you seen? you looking for somebody. Because obviously, we'll see later on, that he was actually, he actually stands there the, we, when we peel the curtain back a little more. We see that Satan is there standing beside God accusing the saints, accusing his people day in and day out. And who's on the other side? Jesus is on the other side defending you. Jesus is on the other side protecting you. We know this is true. I'll get there in a moment. I don't want to try to jump ahead of myself. But uh, Satan accuses Job of only serving God because God of what God can give him. He only serving God because God, God can give him. If, you know, hey, that's hey, if God if God never let me face it, if life was good. The rich people, you know, hey, and life is God. I got all the things in the world. Why wouldn't I bless God? Why wouldn't I thank God? I got everything. Life is good. I got no problems whatsoever. Nothing. My health is good. My family is good. My possessions. I got more money than I can spend. Hey, why wouldn't I be blessing God? But you know, isn't it sad? The Bible tells us it's, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle, which is a small gate at the temple, than it is for a rich man to get in heaven. Those people that should be blessing God, should be thanking God for their great blessings more than anybody else are the most least likely to get saved and least likely to make it into heaven. Isn't that weird? Anyway, he said that, uh, so Satan accuses Job of only serving God because what he can give. 1 Peter 5.8 tells us that be sober, be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. See, he was looking for a way to attack him. He's, look, he's always looking for a way to attack you. Don't give him the option. Don't give him uh, uh, ammunition for his gun to use against you. The prophet, Isaiah, uh, the prophet Hezekiah <clears throat> had a vision. And it was in Ze uh, Zechariah chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. You make a note of this for later. But Zechariah had a vision, and he, this is what he said. He said, and he, saw, he, and he saw me, Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord. Now, Joshua, the high priest here, was the high priest of Israel at that time. It wasn't Joshua that we think about fit the battle and all that stuff. Was this high priest at that time of Zechariah was the high priest. His name was Joshua. And he said he saw the high priest Joshua standing before the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord, by the way, is Another is another term for Jesus. Remember, Jesus is often referred to as the angel of the Lord. So he sees the high priest and standing beside the high priest of the current high priest, he sees in heaven beside him is Jesus. And then he said, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. 
So Satan was standing on one side causing trouble for the man, trying to resist what God wanted to do through Jesus with, jo with Joshua. And verse 2 says, And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuked thee. See, it's not our battle. It's God's battle. We have to allow him to fight our battles for us by giving him the power and the authority to do so. Here Job was doing his own thing, minding his own business, and Satan took notice. Satan standing beside, just like when you read in Job, it says, when the sons of man met, Satan also came and met. And what was he there? He was there to accuse the brethren, to accuse God's righteous. That's what he's there for. And guess what? Jesus was there then too. Because Jesus is eternal. Here he is here. Zechariah hadn't come as a man yet. But he was already there. What was he already doing? He was already defending us. Before he ever came to earth to be a man. He was always there defending us. So we see that. So Satan here was fighting. And we know that Jesus was there. It didn't say that in Job. But we know from Zechariah that Jesus was defending Job, because we know he was doing that. In this vision, the current high priest, we already talked about that, God allowed Satan to test Job by taking all of his possessions. But he said, you can't harm him physically. You can take all his stuff, stuff is stuff. I'm confident you can do what you want to do with his stuff. Take all his stuff from him. He don't care. It won't make no difference. He's going to serve me still. Take it all. It doesn't matter. When well, we see verse 1, Chapter 1, verse 14, 15, first thing he does, the oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them and the sabins fell upon them. They stole all of them. They killed all of their servants but one so he could go tell Job. So he lost all of his oxen and all of his asses. Verse 16, the fire of God has fallen from heaven and that burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. So some type of hail fell from the sky and destroyed all of his he destroyed all of his uh, sheep and all the servants that were watching his sheep, except for the one who came back to tell him. Verse 17, the Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away. And they slain the servants. So they came for those camels. They took all the camels except for the one guy and let him go. Verse 18 and 19, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their elder's brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smoked the four corners of the house that fell upon them and the young men, and they are dead. Man, what a bad day. What a bad day. Won't you agree? Everything he had, all of his possessions and his children, all gone in a moment of time. It was one came right after the other. It appears as one finished, the next one walked to the door and began telling him what happened. One right after the other. I don't know how would you handle it. That would be tough, wouldn't it? Job's response, we see in verse 20. Then Job arose, ran his mantle, shaved his head, fell down on the ground and worshipped. And said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. He said, God is still my God. You can take everything I got, and I'm going to still worship Him. I'm going to still be thankful for Him for all the great things He does for me. Everything I got, He gave me, and He certainly has the right to take it all away. What a great idea for us sometimes. I've been in, there, I've been in times in my life that I was in good place. I've been in some bad place too, haven't you? I've been in times where I, I didn't know where I had to use a credit card to buy gas to get through the next paycheck. I've been there. Have you? But you know what? God is great to us anyway. God can find a way out of it. I'm not there today anymore. God was gracious enough to get me through it. I didn't turn to doing something I shouldn't have done when I didn't have the money I needed to have. He found a way to provide that for me. I kept faith in Him. I kept doing what I needed to do for Him. 
And that's not about me today. I'm just telling you, haven't you been there? He recognized all he had. So no matter what Satan threw his way that day, Job's faith did not waver. Job was thankful no matter what. I don't know about you, how could you handle that situation? Whoo, that would have been tough. Today, they would, you'd go to the doctor, and the doctor would give you all kinds of depression medicine, wouldn't they? I'm not really, I, I'm going to get put my little hat on here. I'm not really in favor of all that depression medicine. Okay? I think we need to pray for God and read our Bibles more and let the Holy Spirit decompress us, depress us. I think that's an easy way mankind is coming. You know, our children are on so much drugs today. I've never seen it in my life. Almost every kid I know has got some drugs they're taking for something. It's sad, isn't it? Some children need drugs. But we got kids that just have behavioral problems, and they give them drugs because they don't want them to have... Uh, most, a lot of parents now give melatonin to their kids to get them to sleep at night. <laughs> Regular routine. Because they don't want to read to them. Because they tell you start reading to somebody, and they'll go to sleep. I do. I try to read, I go to sleep. It's pretty fast. Anyway, I, I meddled in your business there, so ignore that. That was not that was not a God. That was David Barber. Anyway, so Satan determined. Satan is still determined. Remember, Satan's not going to be one and out, though. He's not going to do a one and out for you. You think, oh, I've got over the battle. I'm done. No, 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 no. Oh, no, no, no. He's going to take those claws and try to dig it. He's a roaring lion. He's going to seek another way. He's going to do so. So it says here that uh, Satan is determined and does not go away without a fight. So we see the next day when Satan is accusing men and God again brings up Job. And he said, What do you think of my servant now, Satan? Lucifer? Fallen one? And I don't know what other names he could throw for him. I got some. Bobby, I'll be careful. Uh, all that you did to him, he never once waved in his commitment to me. He's still thankful no matter what. You failed, Satan. You failed. I told you. I told you I knew. I know my man, and he won't going to do it. You took it all from him. Satan said, okay. Hmm. You know what? Yeah, okay. i give you that, God. But if you cause him to suffer, if you give him a little bit of pain, now he starts affecting him personally, you know, not outwardly, but inwardly, oh yeah, he's going to crumble. He's going to crumble like some of those little sticks that you, put, you know, pull the sticks out of. But God had confidence in Job. And so he's told him, okay, I'll tell you what. Do what you want to do to him. Just don't kill him. Because you don't have the authority to kill him. He can suffer physically. You can do whatever you want to him to hurt him, but you can't kill him. He's my man and I got plans for him. But I'll let you do whatever you need to do to him because I have faith. I have confidence. Wouldn't it be great? So sometimes, you think about it sometimes, when we're suffering, maybe God is letting us suffer because he has confidence in us that we will endure when we experience troubles and our troubles are big troubles, it's because God thinks we can handle the big trouble and he wants to show Satan, look at my servant. Look, he can make it. Go do your best to him, man. He is faithful to me to the end, no matter what you put in his way. Oh, man, wouldn't that be something? But most will say, well, I don't know if I want that, Lord. <laughs> I, I don't think I need to prove myself that much. So Satan got permission to afflict him. So Satan's first attack was on Job's body. Verse 7, 2, 7b, he says, He smoked Job with sore, with sore boils from the soles of his foot to his crown, and he took him a, so, so bad that he had to take him a pot shirt to scrape himself with all, and he sat down among the ashes. So he had boils all over his body from the head to his feet, and he sat, had to sit in ashes because the ashes would kind of soothe the open wound. I don't know if you ever had a boil, just one of them. How would you have them all over yourself? Everywhere. I'm talking to even your private parts. 
That'd be bad, wouldn't it? So bad he was having, I said, he'd use these things to scrape what? Scrape the, I'm not, you know, you know what a boil looks like. Trying to relieve himself from those scrapes, those, those, those infections that was boiling up. That was terrible. He was in pain. Pain. I mean, that's real pain. So that's what he tried to do. Second, Satan uses Job's wife to discourage him. You know, isn't it something sometimes when you're troubled, instead of somebody, instead of a Christian being faithful and helping you out, instead of giving you a word of encouragement, they give you a word of discouragement. That's what happened here. His wife discouraged him. I think why I said, you know what? I said, okay, he hurt his body, but the worst thing you do hurting your body is get you a, a, an unhappy wife. What they say, happy wife, happy life. Unhappy wife. I can't even go nowhere else with that one, can I? But it's probably true for husbands too. If you have an unhappy husband, you can have a nagging husband too. He's like a nagging wife. But here it is. Instead of her being a supporter for him, honey, let's pray about it. You know, let's let's let's, let's get with it. let's get with God. Let's see what God can do because God can heal you of all these things. Instead of that, she said, "Curse God and die." <laughs> you got to have some relief. I mean, boy, what a partner that one was. But Satan knew he could use her, and so he did. And sometimes Satan uses people closest to you to discourage you. Let us not be those people, okay? If you've got friends and family who are suffering and are in trouble, let's don't be discouraging to them. Let's find a way to encourage them. Let's find a way to join aside them and help them, not add to their burdens. So Satan uses his, he, 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 he uh, uh, so then Job rebukes his wife. He said, thou speakest as one of a foolish woman speaketh. You sound like somebody who doesn't know God, is what he said. You speak like a foolish person, because see, the fool says in the heart there is no God. He said, you speak like you're not even right with God. Here you're supposed to believe in God like I do, and you're speaking like somebody that doesn't even believe in God, because only those will be the people that would say, curse God and die. The rest of us, if you're right with God, is going to say, I'm going to trust in God no matter what. God, help me. What did we see? That one man that uh, the, the, his son wanted to be, his son was, in, was, was possessed by a demon. And what did he say? Jesus said, listen, all things are possible if you just believe. And what did the man say? Lord, I believe, but help. My unbelief. Well, that's what we should be doing. Helping someone else, encouraging them. Yeah, you're going through some bad times now, but God's got you. God has got you, okay? Yeah, you might have to go through this hard storm in life, but God has got you. Encourage them, strengthen them, help them through. Walk side by side with them. Don't be like this Joe's wife. You talk like a foolish woman, he said. Like someone who don't know God. If you know God, God is in control. God can do anything. Verse 2.10, and all this did not Job sin with his lips. Now it's interesting, they said did not sin with his lips. Makes me think that maybe he had some thoughts. <laughs> Wouldn't you? Come on now, God, help me. <laughs> I can imagine, can't you? Whoo, help me, Lord, please. What in the world? What is going on here? But he did not sin with God against his lips. You know what, sometimes if we have bad things, and we have doubts over our lives. Don't be out there telling people. <laughs> Don't be a discouragement to somebody else. You know, keep it to yourself. Uh, that's what Job did here. He kept it to himself. Satan next uses Job's friends to discourage him. He didn't even ask God permission on this. Because see, he wasn't messing with Job. Now he's messing with his friends. And his friends already was in his pocket. I can get them to do something. It's like his wife. He didn't have to ask God's permission to mess with his wife. His wife was already in his pocket. His friends are in his pocket. So they, uh, he gets his friends, his free friends come visit him. They sat seven days in silence with him. Sat with him for seven days, didn't say anything for seven days. Man, they could have been praying for him for seven days. But they just sat there with him for seven days. End of seven days, they began to criticize him. Even though he had comforted others, his suffering was, was a message from God to show him that he never really understood their pain. That's what they're telling him. Listen, you're suffering now because you really never understood other people's pain, and so that's why God is making you suffer now. His agony must be due to some sin he has committed. You did something, you sinned, and that's why you're suffering. 
Uh, you must have committed some evil to offend God's justice. And, and uh, he should, you, you should strive to exhibit more blameless behavior. You know, you're, not, you're holier than thou sometimes, Job. Whatever wrong Job has done probably deserves greater punishment. You've done something probably that God's probably even liked to you now with this punishment. He probably should do even more to you. Must be wicked to be suffered as he is. He thinks Job's excessive talking is an act of rebellion. And Job defends himself against these false accusations of his friends. You don't, folks don't know what you're talking about. Here he is when he needed comfort. Instead of that, he had his friends were taking him down. Let's don't be those friends that take our people down when they're suffering. So then God responds. God finally interrupts all this. The complaining by his friends is kind of ridiculing Job. And God comes in a whirlwind. Why did he come in a whirlwind? Because he wanted to stop their talking now. (laughs) They were so wrong, he wanted to show them his power. So he shows up in a whirlwind and demands Job to be brave and to respond to his questions. God's questions are rhetorical. He shows how little Job knows about creation. Job was beginning to whine a little bit. And God said, Job, you don't know anything about the creation. You don't need to be complaining about things you don't know anything about. And Job recognized You know, sometimes we get too big for our britches with God too, don't we? And then God has to say, hey, you know who you're talking to? (laughs) Oh, you're right. And when he does, you need to say, you're right, God. You know all, all, you are all, I don't know what I'm talking about for sure. And so he responds. So when Job encountered, Job acknowledges that God has unlimited power amidst the limitation of his own knowledge. Job says, you're right, God. I don't know why you did this. I don't need to know why you did this. I just know you know everything, can do everything, and I'm going to lean upon you. You do with me as you please. And that was the answer that God wanted to hear from Job. And then he said to his friends, he said, Now, now your friends over here, I'm going I'm to do some bad things to them unless you ask me to forgive them. If you're willing to forgive them, I'll forgive them. But if you ain't, life for them is going to be different. So Job prays for his friends, and God then doesn't do damage to them. God intercedes, Job intercedes on their behalf, and God gives them this. Job, God restores Job. He restores his health, providing him twice as much. If you look at Job 42, verse 12 to 13, So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. He had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, 1,000 she-asses. He also had seven sons and three daughters. So God added to him, and he also lived an extremely long life. Job never stopped trusting in God. Job was thankful for whatever situation he found himself in, and his will to fight. Remember we talked about last week about the battlefield. His will to fight we'll find in verse 13, chapter 13, verse 15. This is a verse you need to write down and put in your memory. Job said this, Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Though he slay me. No matter what, I'm going to keep trusting in him. Now, just as Job endured terrible times of testing, we're going to quickly look at the pilgrims. Pilgrims, uh, the only history we really have of the pilgrims is from a guy named William Bradford. William Bradford was uh, the, one of the original pilgrims. Uh, uh, he was the governor. He, he was uh, probably the pilgrim of pilgrims. Uh, his, he was the governor of the colony from uh, the first 33 years. He wrote the Journal of Plymouth Plantation, which is really the primary source that people get anything about the pilgrims, uh, the founding of the pilgrims, the creator of the Mayflower Compact, which, by the way, is a document that we believe is the foundation for the, in- the Declaration of Independence and, and uh, for democracy. The only original history at that time covers the voyage of the Mayflowers and the settlers' first winter in the new land. The voyage was dangerous and miserable. Many of the pilgrims suffered seasickness. They were seen by the crew there as being cargo. Now, if you've ever seen any pictures of this replicas of this Mayflower, it's not that big of a ship. To have 102 uh, people as passengers, plus the people that were the the uh, people that were the, uh, the 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 sailors, and so the sailors had to treat them. They stayed in a small, cramped space under the deck 
most of the time. And that means including having to use their bathroom, they had a potty. And then several times a day, the soldiers have to go and empty it out. Can you imagine the stench down there? For that the, the journey took far more than time it needed to because of storms and all that stuff. It was a terrible, terrible time. Seasickness and and uh, they, 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 the soldiers taunted them. You know, the, the, the sailors did verbal abuse. One of the pilgrims, a young man named John, was actually swept overboard and was had to be saved and brought back on the ship because of the storms. Terrible situation about halfway through. The voice from one of the main beams cracked. And sometimes they had to let the ship just sit there because they had lowered the sail. And it was not an easy journey at all. They finally landed and their misery just began. When they land, the, the, the winter was fierce. Because of the storms, they didn't get to where they're supposed to be. And they were still being in Virginia where they're supposed to be. They're way up north. Well, I don't know about y'all, the weather up north is far worse than the weather down south. <laughs> they got there near about these November, cold winter time, bad time, freezing up stuff. Nothing would grow. All they had was the food they had left on the boat. Well, I guess. God took care of that because he wiped out half of them, right? Half of them died from sicknesses and diseases, so they had plenty of food for that. They were still on the verge of starvation. They did not have to take, they had not taken any, the only food they had was, was what they had for the winter time. Uh, the section of history they call the starving time, that in two or three months at least half of the pilgrims had died, some two or three a day from starvation, scurvy, or other illnesses. Out of the 100 pilgrims, barely 50 lived, and those who lived were hard, were terribly sick. At one time, only six or seven were well enough to care for all the others. They take their they take their dead and they bury them at nighttime because they didn't want the Indians to see their numbers were dwindling so fast. But you know, in the spite of that, do you know where God blew them to? He blew them to a place where there was an established village that the Indians had built that they got smallpox years before and wiped them out and they left the village abandoned. But it was a village already, a village already cleared out, had things that are already out there. So they were able to go into, and he blew them right there near it. So they were able to go into that village. See, God prepared for them even in the spite of that. Although they endured tragedies and horrible living conditions, the pilgrims still thank God. In the fall of 1621, where their laborers were rewarded with a bountiful harvest, a year of sickness, scarcity, the pilgrims gave thanks to God. In spite of all the trouble, in spite of all that, they continued to do it. Paul says in Ephesians 5, 19-20, he says, Speaking to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. No matter what comes your way, give thanks to God. That's what they did. Paul's main objective was praise, thanksgiving, talking about a continuing uh, attitude of the Christians. How are we to be to each other? How can we have this attitude continually? We need a proper perspective. I'm going to quickly give you three things. Look at three things that keep us, keep us from being unthankful. First thing is that keeps us from being thankful is our pride. If you think of pride, nobody ever gave me anything. I worked hard for everything I have. Haven't you heard people that? I pulled myself up by my own bootstraps. I owe it all to me. Pride can keep you from being thankful to God. That too, we feel no one to thank but ourselves. The Lord humbled Job so completely that he replied in verse chapter 42, verse 5 and 6, said, I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eyes seeth thee. Wherefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. He said, I know of you, I am nothing. You're everything. Not only our pride, but also our critical spirit or constant complaining can prevent us from being thankful. Instead of being grateful, this person here will find something to complain about. Instead of finding something good, there's always something negative. You know people like that? Always negative. We're reading the Pentateuch. Remember the story. I'm not going to go through all this, but remember the story where the Jews were traveling. They, God had freed them from the slavery of the bondage of Egypt. And they were traveling, and to feed them, He gave them, they asked for food, and God gave them manna. 
Every day, manna, they could go pick up, except for the sixth day. They picked up enough for the seventh day, because they couldn't pick up on the seventh day. Some of them went on the seventh day, didn't find any. Some of them tried to save enough on the, on the one day to the next day, but it had worms in it. God gave you a plan, what did that do? Well, guess what? After a while, they started complaining about it. God has just given us this bread. Numbers 11, 4 and 6 says, And the mixed multitude that was among the Jews, the among them fell lusting, and the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic, but now our soul is dried away. There's nothing at all beside this manna before our eyes. They complained about God giving them this miraculous bread every single day that they didn't have to do anything for but pick up. But they complained. Complaining can keep you from being thankful, can't it? Their ungrateful response was, what, manna again? I got this manna again. <laughs> we want to go back to Egypt. Let's go back to Egypt. They got the nice old cucumbers and melons. and Oh, man, I want that. I this old nasty bread. I'm tired of it. Give me something else. I don't want that. Let's go back to Egypt where life was better. Was it better being outside the will of God? And when the people, 11, verse 1, 2, and when the people complained, it displeased the Lord, and the Lord heard it, and his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burnt among them, and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. And the people cried unto Moses, and when Moses prayed to God, Lord, the Lord fire, the fire was quenched. They complained, and God said, okay, you think you got a bad now? Okay, let me tell you, I've had enough of that. And wiped them out. <laughs> the group where they were complaining. Complaining robs us of our thankfulness. Consistent griping can separate us from God and from other people. We've seen pride, we've seen critical spirits, and lastly, our carelessness. Someone once said that the stars, if the stars only came out once in a while, we would be fascinated by the stars. How many of us see the stars every night and don't think a thing about them? We see the moon come up 20-some days a month. <laughs> I saw so many days, remember, it's not up. But we see the moon come up. Are we fascinated? We say, yep, that's the moon. Becomes old hat for us. But it's an amazing thing, isn't it? It's amazing what God does. The stars are amazing. We live in a town that's hard to see the stars a lot of times. We see the brightest ones, but we can't. When we come out here to outside the country where you folks live, I tell you, there ain't no lights nearby. There ain't no light on this road here. I mean, it's dark. I'd hate to walk down that road at nighttime. Because, I mean, there ain't nothing. It's pitch black. There ain't no moon out. There ain't nothing. I mean, this little beacon for sure. Or something. I see the bright light over there, but the point is, you can see plenty of stars out there, can't you? You know, the Israelites crumbled, grumbled because they had no food and because they had experienced this day after day after day, and so they began to become complacent. Because of pride, carelessness, critical spirit, they never truly thanked God for what He had given them. Paul writes about the proper attitude in Philippians 4, 6, through 7, he says, Be careful for nothing, for in everything but prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and mind through Jesus Christ. Be thankful in whatever you do, and He will give you the desires of your heart. It baffles the unbelievers when we are thankful in spite of the troubles. When you thank God when you're going through troubled times, it baffles unbelievers because they want to know, how can I get that? Why don't people want to be saved today? Because they don't see anything that's worth getting saved for. You know, I got to go to church on Sunday. That's all they see. They don't see the good things. All they see is the bad things. Because guess what? We complain about going to church. Yeah, I, got to, I can't go. I got to go to church on Sunday. Instead of saying, man, I got to go to church. Come with me on church on Sunday. We got something going on. Yeah. <laughs> Come on with us. Talk about it positive. Say, no, I got to go to church on Sunday. It's true, ain't it? Grumbling and complaining. So many people facing Job's circumstances or the pilgrim circumstances would turn their back on God. Job demonstrated his faith in humbling himself and acknowledged the Lord. Psalms 30, 11 through 12 says, Thou hast turned from me my mourning into dancing. Thou hast put off my sackcloth and girded me with gladness. To the end that my glory may sing praise to thee and not be silent. O Lord my God, I will give thanks unto thee forever. Our comprehension and our apprehension of God's goodness is something that changes our lives. While many people spend a great deal of time enlarging their, their prayer list, 
I've got it. How much time do we do enlarging our praise list? Your praise list should be bigger than your prayer list. I'm guilty too, so I can't, I'm not, I'm, like I said, I got one, three, five, back to me. But it's true. Let's God goodness guide your thoughts. So the question for you today as we close, are you saved today? You know, I've got to ask you, because I hate for you to walk out the door today if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, walk out this door and say, well, no one talked to me about Jesus. If you're not saved today, today's the day. If you want to be thankful for God, today's the day. If you want to understand about the blessings of God, today's the day. Because see, once you ask Jesus to save you, the Holy Spirit comes inside you and changes you into a new creature, and then you have something to be thankful for. If you're not saved, you ain't got much to be thankful for except the breath in your nose that God is still giving you another day to make that decision. Because when that time ends, there is nothing but weeping and gnashing of teeth. Not trying to scare anybody, but simply saying this fact. If you're not saved, today is the day Jesus gave his life for us while we were sinners to give us the gift of eternal life. So if you, come to, if you don't know Jesus and you come and accept him, I assure you, you'll be thanking us today. This will be a true thanksgiving for you. If you're a Christian, but have allowed circumstances in your life to steal your thankfulness, Steal your thankfulness for God's grace, for His blessings in your life. You can ask Him to forgive you for your sin. Job needed to ask forgiveness because he got a little bit whiny. Now, I can't say nothing because I think I'd have been whining a long time before that. Isn't it great the Bible shows us the good, bad, and the other? He didn't just show Job, he showed Job had a, he did start whining, self-pity. He won't complain about God, he was complaining about himself, self-pity. And start complaining about himself. And God said, don't complain about my man. <laughs> you are what I want you to be. In spite of whatever your troubles might be. Trouble comes to all of us. But knowing who God is and our final destination can make us thankful no matter what Satan tactics may be. No matter what Satan attacks us for. If you've allowed Satan to take your thankfulness away, God can renew it today. You can come and say, Lord, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for all you've done for me. Thank you for, first of all, saving a poor, rotten sinner like me. I'm no better than anybody. The worst, vilest sinner to ever live. He and I are cousins. Blood kin. Both of us needing a Savior. I accepted the gift he did not. We must be thankful for God for everything he does for us. If you're here today and you uh, need the altar, the altar is open. And uh, let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for this opportunity I have. Thank you, Lord. I thank you. I just can say thank you, Lord. Thank you for all the things you do for us. Thank you for your mighty blessing. Thank you, Lord, as Job saw your great blessings, Lord, as Satan tried to attack him. Help us, Lord, to endure those times when we have temptations to be ever mindful and thankful. As the pilgrims, Lord, who gave their lives for a belief in freedom to worship you, they never lost their thankfulness in spite of all their hardships. Help us, Lord, in spite of the hardship that comes our way. As Satan attempts to attack us, Lord, help us be worthy of the faith and trust you put in us that we stand the test of time. If there's people today, Lord, that's struggling, today, the day the altar is open. For in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.